Thank you, Sister Barb, for that prayer. As I was listening to my sister in Christ and my daughter, Cindy, read, I can see how she's been doing better and better as we've been progressing. And you, that's the way things are usually they go. With this preaching here, speaking the word of God, I am, I do feel more confident in many areas, but also the more I speak, the more I see, the more I feel like a, like this is big, what we're doing here. And I, I, it's not that I didn't take it serious before, but I'm, I'm seeing it more and more clearly. Lord, and I find myself praying more as I'm preparing these sermons. The Lord help me to, to say the right things and to, and to, to speak what you want me to say, not come up with my own ideas here. This letter to the Romans, as I, I've been preparing for this, I just continue to rejoice and see this as a letter of love from God. It, and I'll show you why I say that. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because, you know, I just know God loves us and know all that. that. That's not the kind of love I'm talking about. It's what God is doing. I'm rejoicing in this, seeing what kind of a God that we have. And in the way he reacts and the way he does things is it's, it's, he doesn't change. It's the same all the way from back in the prophets until now. He's, he's working a work and it's not changing. It's complete and it's, it's stable. It's not wishy-washy and, and, well, that didn't work out. Let's try how this worked. No, it's, it's stable. And uh, so here's Paul. He's, he's uh, writing to not unbelievers in Rome. They had unbelievers in Rome. They had plenty of them. But he was writing to believers. It says here that these are uh, beloved of God who he's writing to. They, these were called to be saints. So they're, they're saints that he's writing to. And these saints, they're in Rome. They've, they've joined themselves together. I, we don't know how they came together. Paul's writing to them. He hadn't been there yet to see them. Paul, so Paul hasn't put these, these believers together here. And, but he saw their faith working. And this, this gave him a desire to write to them. And uh, when I was preparing, I thought, you know, this is how... The body does. It comes together. It, this is, Rome was run not by godly people. This was, they're run by despots. That it was not an area you'd think with that Christianity would just flourish. But here you go. You got these believers that believe in Christ Jesus and nothing can stop them from coming together. And uh, so they came together here. We, see, we don't put our trust in men. I, I have uh, recently been around and heard of people talking about, in our situation where we are in this world, in the, in our, the government that we have, if some believers don't really feel excited about who's in charge. But see, God is in charge. Christ Jesus is in charge. We don't put our trust in men. We put our trust in God. That's why we call ourselves believers, because we believe in God. We believe in what he's doing. We believe that he, when he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And uh, we have a lot of reasons for believing that. And it's not like we're just believing blindly. We just, I know that there are some people who are blinded who think that people that call themselves believers, they just, because they're just dumb, that's why they just believe anything. No, we don't believe anything. We believe what is true and what is right. So this is what Paul found here in the Romans. And this, this, and I'm gonna, I said this I, later on in my notes. I have this, but I, I just, just rejoiced in, in seeing this. That here he says to all her own Rome. Well, he's not talking to everybody in Rome. He's talking to the saints. But see, this is a kingdom way of speaking. 
when you're looking at a group of people, it's the believers who make, the, that's who matters. It doesn't matter that mass of people, it's who's in that mass. Believers, the, the people that God has called, that's who matters. And you see that here, he says, to all in the be in Rome. We know he's not writing a letter just to Rome. So I just, I, I'm skipping way ahead there, but I'm just rejo- I rejoice in that as I was preparing for this, that get God, he's looking at his people. Not the, not the numbers. That's how men look. Men look at numbers. Well, it must be right if everybody is calling out for him to be crucified. That must be the right. See, it, if, if, if a whole bunch of people are saying it, that must be right. Numbers aren't right. God is right. Amen. What God is doing is, is right. So Paul's writing to, and he doesn't, and another thing that I, stuck out to me, he's not dumbing this down. He's not writing to unbelievers. He's writing to believers because they're the ones that matter. He's not dumbing it down because the called will respond. The called will they'll love the truth. They'll cling to it. They'll want it. They'll, they'll desire it. And they will, they will not need for the message to be dumbed down. You give them the message that God has given you and the, and the called will, will rise up and and. And hear it and take a hold of it. And so this is why this is not a, a dumbed down letter. He doesn't go to many explanations and stuff. He, he, does, um, he does talk about a lot of things. But it doesn't have to be dumbed down and babied and wishy-washy. He's talking to believers. No need to dumb this down. And this, is a, this letter is a, it's a foundational letter. That he's, he's, he's reasserting the foundations that, that really matter. He, uh, Psalm, 1, I mean, Psalm 11, 3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Mm-hmm. So it, this, is, this is why it's important what Paul is um, writing to, the, to believers. Not unbelievers, but to believers. Paul says, Paul, a servant... Of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separate unto the gospel of God. See, faith can take a hold of this. See, it, without faith, it's it's hard to it is hard to understand a lot of these things. But by faith, we can we can take a hold of this. Faith can take a divinely inspired message and grow with it, and be able to see it. For what it is and, and grow. The Romans, they are these these people he's writing to, they already had faith. This is what attracted Paul to them. Was their faith. He says in uh he said at one time he said, yet. He longed to come there to impart some spiritual gifts. So we know he had not yet been there. But it's because of their, their faith that attract him to attract him to them. When a man of God like Paul sees faith in a people, he desires to see it grow and to increase and to bring forth fruit. And Paul was a servant of Jesus Christ. So he had the mind of Christ. And this is how Christ is. He, to, be, to be stagnant or falling back. This is not the way we're intended to be. We are intended in, in fact to be growing. And to moving forward. Last year. Now I mentioned this with my daughter Sydney. If she was reading the way she read last year. Nikki and I would come together and say. Okay there's something not working out here. I don't, we don't know if it's because of the way she's being taught or maybe we, she's got a problem mentally. There's a problem. In the kingdom of God, I don't know why this is, but there's many people have been in the world in, uh, in calling themselves believers and Christians for like 30 years and they haven't changed. There is something wrong there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
the, the, the manner of the kingdom is growth. Yes. <clears throat> so, so Paul, he desires. I mean, this is a servant of God also is someone who desires to see God's people do well. More than what he really worries about himself. Unselfish, focused on Christ, wanting to do the will of God, seeing his people, wanting, desiring for them to do well. And this is the way Paul is. You know, if you find yourself, if any believer finds themselves thinking of themselves more than God's people, that should be a red flag right there. There should be something going up saying to you, what am I looking at? Because when you're looking at Christ, you have a desire for God's people to do well. You really, And this is how Paul is. God's people are servants of Christ. They think of themselves last. He was called by God to do the work of God. So this is why we see Paul is a helper of God's people. Because we know that they can't do, this is not, we cannot move forward on our own strength. See, on our own strength, we're, we're just going to fall. We won't be able to grow, but in Christ Jesus, this is where we can grow. Not in our own strength, but in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Because we are justified. That's who we, we are justified. Because of that we are united with Christ. This is why we are justified. Because of our, if we're off doing our own thing, we're on our own. But because we are united with Christ Jesus, this is why we're justified. Amen. Without Christ, all we have to offer is our flesh. And we know that is, our flesh is dead to God. We will not be with him no matter how good we think we are. We're dead. And, and this is separation from God. So what he's doing here is reaffirming the foundations here to the, God's people. And when you see Christ more clearly, this will help you grow. This will help. And when you're growing in Christ Jesus, this is where you are accepted when you're united with Christ. So what does this mean, brother? In, our, in Christ, our future is very bright. That's what it means to us. You know when somebody's downcast, it's not because they're looking at Christ. I know this personally. When I've had my hardest times, it wasn't because I was seeing Christ clearly. It wasn't because what was up ahead was so bright to me and so clear to me that I was downcast. And I'm looking at the dirt. It was because I, something happened that took my eyes off of Christ. Because when your eyes are on Christ and when you, there's something, something bursting on your heart that's clear about Jesus Christ and what he's doing, this will vault you into a position where whatever's going on around you, it just falls dead. Yeah. And you are rising up and you, you just see what you have in Christ Jesus and it will overcome you with joy. That's when you, when you're the most joyous is when you're seeing Christ the clearest. So what does justification do for God's people? It gets their eyes off of here and now and compels them to look to there and then. Giving God's people hope. Hope in a brighter future. One that is separate from this cursed realm into a time when they will be with their God, and he will not be ashamed to, be, to call them his people. In Christ, you can see this clearly. God is working a purpose. This will take the pressure off of you. This will help you to be strong when you see that this is God's purpose. This isn't a purpose that he gave to you and said, now you work it out and let's see how, it's, how you do with it. He's not going to give you something like this to handle. This is his purpose that he's working out. He's working out his purpose through Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is the key. He is the key. This is why Paul said, separate unto the gospel. He can't be 
working in this world and working. See, this is where people go wrong. They spend too much of their time thinking and, and looking at this world and not enough time thinking about Jesus and thinking about what Christ is doing, what God's doing, his purpose through Christ Jesus. They fall dead. They have, what do they have to offer anybody when all they can think about is the world? They can't even get themselves up off the ground. To forget about offering God's people something. Jesus said, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So wouldn't it make sense to you that we wouldn't put our focus on this world? That we would put all of our focus on Christ? And this is what Paul's doing. Paul was not for this world. He was separate. He was detached from this world. Let me, let me just say that Paul did excel in the world. And he could have excelled. Here, let me give you an example. What I'm, ta- what I'm talking about here is, is he, his focus was not this world. But if it was, if it was, if someone would say, well, yeah, you know. Listen, remember the time when he was, he was about ready to get scourged? This is in uh, Acts 22:25. This sh- I'll show you how sharp Paul he was. He had, he could do other things than what he was doing, but this he was called to do this. Right. He answered the call. He was separate, separate from the world. This is what it says. It says he's getting ready to be scourged. Now, now this is not a, a, something where he's like, "Come on over here." I, this is violent. Most people would crumble under this type of pressure. When somebody's ripping the, the, your shirt, ripping the back of your shirt and getting ready to scourge you and throwing you down, this is a violent act that most people would just crumble. And Paul, he had, uh, his mind was clear, and this is what he says, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman, uncondemned? He's reasoning with these violent people and he takes authority over the situation in Christ Jesus and he's able to reason with them the law, their law. This is their law. He's able to reason with their law under this kind of situation. Now, see, like, he was like a, he's like a skillful lawyer going before the judge debating why not that their client should be put in prison. But under a situation of most people, their minds would be, you know, I'm getting ready to get beat. What's going on? They're throwing me down. He's able to have a clear mind and reason with them. Amen. Now, don't you think that some people would say, Paul, you should be a lawyer. You know, do you know how many Christians you could help out if you would just stand before them in the courts and, and help them to get out of their, these, these different situations? Uh, this is how men think. See, we want to get out of that situation of thinking about how men would do things and see how God is separating a people for himself. Paul had a lot to offer the world. He really did. But Paul wasn't, he, this is not what he was doing. He was called separate, just as he's calling us to be separate. A people separate from the world. And, and, and you know, Paul, if this was not, when he reasoned with them, he wasn't reasoning because he didn't want to get beat. His reasoning was because he was doing a work for God. He even said in Acts 25, 11, he says, For if I be offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, wherefore these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Amen. Again, see, you know, he's, hey, if I, if I have a common, I'll take a common. But see, again, he's reasoning with them. Yeah. Like a skillful lawyer reasoning on the basis of the kingdom of God. Because he's doing a work for the Lord, for God. He's separate to do a work for God. Paul said, continuing with this, Paul said, I continue unto this day, 
witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. He is, he is doing God's work here. Now, again, what I was telling you before, God doesn't change. From the prophets until now, it's all the same. He's doing a work through his son, Jesus Christ, and Paul is continuing with this work. He's not going off on his own. He's not coming up with a new idea. You need to be careful that. If you hear somebody saying something that doesn't, go, it doesn't line up with what God has done from all the way to the beginning, they're false prophets. They say, they say, well, God has given me a word. And then you, you listen to what they say and you say, well, you know what? That doesn't sound anything like about what God said before. Is this a new message that God came up with? All of a sudden God changed his message and gave you something different? God has never given a different message. His message has been the same. Amen. And Paul, Paul affirms that here, that in the prophets, they were speaking about Jesus Christ. And he, he explains that. In Acts 28, 23, when he says that, both out of the law of Moses and of the prophets, Jesus was declared by the prophets. Isaiah 53, 2, give you some examples here. Isaiah 53, 2 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form of comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah 62, 1 says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake will I not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as the brightness and as the salvation, of, salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And then verse 3, it says, Thou shalt also be crowned of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of God. Psalm 49, 15 says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. And Psalm 110, 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See, it all it's all the same. It all lines up. God isn't going off in different directions. It's all connecting. It's all going together. And Paul is staying with this. He's, stay, he's keeping on track with what God is doing. He's not diverting from it. He's continuing with what God's doing. The prophets declared it, and Paul is continuing on with it. Amen. And, declare, and Paul says, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience right. to the faith among all nations for his name. Mm -hmm. It's what God is doing in Christ Jesus. The kingdom of God is not puffed up, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4.19 what would it matter? This is real power we're talking about. In Christ, we have what we need. See, all these things are going to... Just at the break, I was just talking to Brother Given uh, and just thinking about this. All these things are going to be gone. So, like, who cares if somebody stores up a bunch of stuff and on their deathbed, they never gave themselves to Jesus Christ and they have... What do they have at the end? Nothing. So they think that this whole time that their needs were met, but they really had one need, to be saved. They needed a savior, and they wasted their whole life collecting stuff, yeah. and at the end, they had zero. Yeah. But in Christ Jesus, we have everything. We know all things were given to him. So in Christ, we have everything. I mean, it, I know it just make, it's very clear and it makes sense, but why is it? Because people are blinded. They've taken their eyes off of Christ and then putting their eyes on something else and they become blinded to the truth. Because in Christ, the truth seems very clear to you. The decision is very clear. Should I go after sin? Well, God forbid. 
But Christ Jesus is much more, much better than anything this world has to offer. Amen. So this power we're talking about, it's not, I was thinking about this. It's like if you had a car that had all the working parts, but you had no fuel. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a beautiful car. You know it all works good and everything, but who cares if you can't get all the way to the end of the finish line? But Christ Jesus, he's got everything and the power to do it. Amen. So it would mean nothing without this power, but he has power. If we don't cross the finish line, who really cares? He has power in order to, for justification, sanctification, and glorification to those who believe in him. What is to be justified that we are cleansed? We have righteousness of God. We are sanctified, separate from the power of sin, and brought into conformity into the image of Jesus Christ. We are sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are glorified. We will be like him, perfect, spotless, and blameless. For this is what we need power to do. And in Christ we do have power. The power that Jesus has for you. Now we're talking about the gospel of God. Now we're talking. Somebody says, what is the gospel of God? Well, this is in Christ Jesus. What Christ is doing. Ephesians 1, 21, 23 says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to be to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fulfilleth all in all. That's everything. Christ has got it. So why would you go anyplace else? Amen. You go to him. You want to know about him? If you want life, you want, you want life, you want life more abundantly, he's got it. If you want to be set free, it's in Christ. Nowhere else can you get these answers. Nowhere else will your need be met. It's in Christ. So Paul says, among whom ye are also the called of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ that you have called. Of him. To all that be in Rome. Now see, doesn't that make sense now? Christ is everything. Anybody outside of Christ? Well, that, that Christ plus uh, zero is everything. Everything in your own mind without Christ. All, you've got everything. You've got no Christ. It adds up to zero. So that, now this makes sense. To all that be in Rome. Beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, peace from our God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, you've got the grace and the peace from the God, uh, Father, and Lord Jesus Christ because you're called and because you're in Christ. That last part isn't for you outside of Christ. If you're not in Christ, you don't get grace and you don't get peace. And that, what, that answers a lot of questions when people say, why is this happening to me? Why? And they, go to, they go to psychologists over and over again for years and years and years. And they're worse off when they were before they started going to the psychologist. What's going on? I've got no peace. I, because without Christ, you don't have peace. Without Christ, grace isn't given to you. Amen. It's in Christ. And this is the work of God. Men's not going to receive glory for this. God receives the glory. Amen. So now you see why when I'm preparing for this, I was just like, this is the love of God. God has called us. He's, he's called us to be with his son. And because of that, we have everything that we need. We did not ask to be called. He called us. The master said, I have room on my table. Come and dine with me. Come. Come dine with me. 
I tell you, this, I don't know about you, but I was rejoicing thinking about this, our God, the type of God he is, how he is the God of everything, he's the creator of everything. He's calling me to be with him. Come and dine with me. Set at my table. In Christ Jesus, I'm making it possible. You know what that did for me? That made me want less of this world. And that made me want more of Christ. That made me want to grow in Christ, to have more understanding, to surround myself with people that knew Christ. That's what it does for me. And that's what it will do for anyone who can see this clearly. And this is what Paul is opening up to the Romans, the Roman people. He's laying out these, these, these wonderful foundations so that they can grow up. Not so they can just go backwards. Stay. Like, who's going to be saved if everybody's weak and can't help anybody? That's why he's writing to the, the beloved of God to help them to grow and strengthen so the word will be get, go out. See, it's so backwards when somebody says, we need to go out to the saved. First, you get the believers built up and strengthened, and then you can't hold them back. Amen. Then everybody they're talking to, they're talking about Christ. See, while well, it makes sense, you don't put the, the horse before the, um, the, the cart before the horse. You're not going to get nowhere. See, you build up God's people. This is what Paul is doing. Well, I mean, so what did we have to offer God? He called us. What did, what did we have to offer except for sh sin and shame? This is what we, we had nothing to offer. And God called us. This is a loving God reaching out to his people. Come to me. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. And grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. When, would, when did this happen? Before the world began. So he's not changed. This is why the prophets talked about it. It's all the way from there to now. And he's going to, in Christ, we're going to make it all the way there. Now, listen to the tenderness of how he speaks, Apostle Paul takes to, speaks. He says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from our God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Doesn't that sound good to you? Amen. Saints, beloved of God, beloved of, to me, somebody says beloved, that sounds real good, especially coming from knowing that the creator of all things says you are beloved. Not that you're going to be not that you're going to be a saint. Paul is saying he's talking to the saints. They are saints in Christ Jesus. And again, he says to all that are in Rome, because God's people are the only ones that matter. Everybody outside of Christ, it doesn't matter. And I know that doesn't sound good to people that aren't outside of Christ, but when you're in Christ, that sounds real good. When you're abiding in Christ Jesus, that sounds real good. Believers are special to God. They are loved by God, set apart to be with God. Because of Jesus, we have favor with God. We, there's no value on what men think about this. It's what God thinks. And he's invested everything in Christ Jesus. God will, God is well pleased with his son. Amen. And those who are in Christ, he's well pleased with too. It all, everything depends on Jesus. So let us despise everything that takes our heart and minds off of Christ. And let us cling and run to those things that help us to see Christ more clearly. Amen. Thank you, brother.